Welcome to the TK Show with the Athletic Bay Area's Editor-in-Chief, Tim Kawakami. Hey everybody, Tim Kawakami here. There's been a little break in TK show. There's an explanation for that. You probably don't want to hear it right now. I will explain it at some later point. It's new and exciting and brave and courageous and all those things. Uh, none of those things, actually. But great to, after a little bit of a break, great to have on as my, sh- as my guest on this show, the Athletics senior writer, covers the Giants, obviously has covered Giants for many years, Andrew Baggerly. Bags, how are you today? TK, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Every, things are happening. There is never a slow time. Everything happens all at once, all the time. But that's okay. We roll. We don't <laughs> want it to be boring. Bags, uh, you got the winter meetings coming up, what, in about a week and a half uh, in Vegas. There's reports, obviously, about the, what the Giants may or may not do. What, what are your thoughts just b- basically on what they are going to try to do, what things they might try to set up going into the winter meetings? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think this is just a very different off season and a different way to think about the off season for the Giants, uh, all because the, the the person in charge is different for the first time in a couple of decades. And you know, I think we all kind of tended to think about the off season uh, as as you know, what are their needs, what are their inputs, you know third base, uh, right-handed middle-of-the-order hitter, uh, you know, left-handed reliever, number four starter. You know, you could sort of come up with a shopping list, so to speak. And, and I think that we're going to have to have a much different definition for what we think their roadmap is going to be because under Farhan's IED, I think it's basically going to be stockpile talent. Mm-hmm. Get as much talent on that 40-man roster as possible. Get as much talent in that minor league system as possible and look for value, look for as much talent as you can acquire. And it's not just prospects, but maybe guys who are in arbitration years and, and maybe even guys in free agent years. Um, but, you know, there, there's a reason that they didn't load up that 40-man roster all the way. They've got open spots on it after protecting for the Rule 5 draft. And I think you're going to see them just be very open-minded to any way that they can stockpile talent at any position, uh, at any, uh, in any, any way that they can help uh, – uh, win now and into the future. Of course, the name that has come up is Mazamo Garner. No, no mystery to anybody that he's coming up on his last year. Uh, he could be wanting a very expensive long-term contract. They're not exactly a, a, a team that's thinking about the playoffs or, or expecting the playoffs. Uh, do you think that this is real, that they could be moving Bumgarner, or is, are these kind of flares out there just maybe because they're inching down that road and maybe won't get there for a few months? Well, this is going to resolve itself one of three ways, I think. Either they trade him now or at the trade deadline in uh, July, or they extend him to what isn't going to be a one- or two- or three-year contract. We know that because he's been underpaid for so long. Or they let him get to the end of the deal uh, at the end of next season and let him walk as a free agent. And I think that that is the least likely scenario, uh, that they just get to the end of the deal and let him walk. Um, I think that maybe... The next least likely scenario is they extend him, given all their payroll commitments going through you know, 2020, 2021. Um, I, I think that they need to keep as much financial flexibility as they can and, and, and giving a huge extension to a guy who, you know, if you read you know, Saris's piece and you look at uh, how his stuff in command have declined obje- objectively, uh, it just wouldn't seem to be a very sound decision of uh, putting all the emotion aside of, of who he is and what he's done. Um, so, you know, that leads you with the most likely scenario is that they trade him. And I think that they absolutely are exploring what his trade value is, what they would get back, because it may not be worth their while uh, for, you know, what, what they could get back for him uh, versus if he has a couple of really good months next year and all of a sudden, you know, you've got maybe a, a smaller list of teams contending at that point in the market for him. But imagine the Yankees and Red Sox getting in a bidding war yep. over having Madison Bumgarner in peak form if he has a good start to the year yep. as a guy who can help you down the stretch and into, hello, the playoffs, mm-hmm. which is kind of where this guy has become an iconic figure. Now I think you're talking about getting you know, a much nicer package. And you know we look at what rentals get, and they don't get a lot. But you look at Aroldis Chapman and, and what uh, the Yankees got for him. I mean, they got Glaber Torres for him, mm-hmm. for starters. And that was for just a couple months rentals. And I think sometimes you can get more uh, for a couple months of a guy than you can for a whole year of a guy. 
just because, you know, teams get in that position and they're like, okay, now we're going to throw caution to the wind. We're going to go for it. So I think that's probably going to end up being uh, the Giants' best play where they can get the most value. And that, that means Bumgarner has to come back and have a solid April, May, June, July. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's a reasonable degree of confidence that, that he will. Um, but yeah, I think right now, if they were to trade Bumgarner, they might be selling low. And so maybe it's not going to be, um, the most likely move, uh, but they've got to flesh it out and they got to find out exactly what they can get. And, and that's what you're hearing about now. What do you think Bumgarner's head is right now? Do you, do you think he'd like to maybe if this is going to happen, why don't we just get it done now? Or do you think he wants to stick it out with this team we, where he's had so much success? No, oh, I, I think he's probably chopping trees or, or you know, <laughs> shoeing horses. or Probably he or, is. He absolutely or, is. If he's not the National Finals Rodeo. Um, you know, I, I really think that he doesn't pay a whole lot of mind to it. Um, he's been so low-key this whole time about, you know, the time he was underpaid. We ask him again and again and again, what's your contract situation like? What do you think? Do you want to sign an extension? You know, uh, and, and he's just, you know, he, he really just doesn't, I don't think there's a lot of that in his head space because he knows he can't control it. And, uh, he, he is a very disciplined thinker. I, I will tell you, you know, he comes off like this old, you know, galoot, but he's a pretty sharp guy. I think he knows, um, you know, he sizes up a, a problem or a situation and he says, what can I do to control this situation? And if it's nothing, then I don't think he really pays much attention to it. So, um, I think he realizes that it's all going to work out for him and his legacy is secured regardless of what happens. So I don't think that he's probably too preoccupied with it. How good. I mean, you know, wrote the story about it and when we saw the peripherals are not good and they're going down every year. And, you know, as he said, even you know, if you say you can work with a 91 mile power, 92 mile power fastball down from 94, 95, it's just flatter. It's not moving as much. And it's there's the separation with his other pitches isn't as much. It just hurts him across the board. Do you think he has an in him to, to come back to a, you know, let's not even say an ace. I don't know if that's possible anymore. But to be a solid, strong number two starter that you're happy to go up against anybody. I do. I think that he, this is a guy who I think has aptitude that's off the charts. He knows how to attack hitters. He also has been pitching in a ballpark that's very favorable, uh, and he's not missing bats nearly as much as he used to. So you put him in a livelier park, um, you know, maybe maybe it wouldn't translate as well. But this is a guy who who I think he finds a way with what he has. And also, you know, he told me a couple times he didn't really want it out there during the season last year, uh, so he told me it more on background, that, you know, when he fractured his, his uh, uh, fifth metacarpal, you know, his hand strength wasn't nearly what it needed to no. be, and he wasn't getting the movement on the cutter uh, that that he was happy with. And so I think he was going to some other pitches. So I do think that when he came back, and, and it probably affected some of the data and some of the metrics on his spin rate and all that other stuff, um, you know, the, the fact that he did come back as soon as he did from that fractured hand. So, um, you know, I, I do think that situation can be a little bit better. And the fact that he's got fewer innings on his arm the last two yep, years, yep. Uh, that may help too. Uh, obviously, Farhan coming in is a huge culture change for the franchise. What do you, just from the people you know who've been here for so long, maybe not just Sabian and Bochi, but those guys obviously are hugely important. What's their sense of, uh, are you you talked to Bochi and he sound kind of excited about the new start. Is is that the sense you get from kind of up and down the line, rank and file of people who, who have, known only kind of one way and now are having a whole different approach to this? No, I think there's a lot of trepidation in the Giants front office, and there should be, because I think that they're, you know, this is a front office that's had a lot of continuity, and now there's a big change at the top. And, uh, you know, ultimately what's going to happen with the, the scouting director? What's going to happen with, uh, you know, um, who's going to be the interim farm director? And eventually, you know, who's going to take that job? Um, who's you know, going to be the, the G- who's going to be the GM? I, I even asked you about that. right, yeah. and and they they may not end up making a move there if they can't get the permissions to talk to the people that they want to talk to. Um, but uh, you know, I think that that I I, I, I give Farhan Zaidi a lot of credit because he's a really really smart guy, but he's not um, egotistically smart. And by that, uh, I'll draw a parallel to for you um, when Bill Newcomb took over. Uh, from Peter McGowan as the managing general partner. The Giants were, were obviously not doing well. They had four straight losing seasons. Bochi and Sabian were in the final years of their contract. 
uh, you know, Newcomb could have been a guy who says, look, I'm really, really smart. I, you know, was on the ground floor of Microsoft. I'm president of the American Bar Association. I'm the smartest person in any room I walk into. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to get my consultants. We're going to get our headhunters going. We're going to hire the best and brightest in clean house. He didn't do any of that. He basically said, I'm going to take my first year uh, in this position and I'm going to evaluate everybody and I'm going to set some standards and just see, you know, how they perform. And uh, the Giants had an uptick in 2009 and finished over 500. And uh, that allowed you know, Bochi and Sabian to, to get new contracts. And then we know what happened in 2010. So if Bill Newcomb has a completely different approach uh, to clean house right away, then, you know, the Giants aren't sitting here with, with the first World Series. If they don't have that, maybe they don't have any of them. So um, I, I really kind of liken uh, Farhan Zaidi to, to Bill Newcomb in that mm. regard. I think he knows he's really, really bright and really smart. He's on the cutting edge of a lot of things. But I think that he also n- knows that he doesn't know everything. And there's a lot of institutional knowledge that he's inheriting uh, at these levels of, of both the front office and the coaching staff. And look, we all know that Bruce Bochy's in the last year of his deal. And we all know that you know, it's probably likely this will be his last year as manager, but no one's told him that. No one's made that decision yet. Um, and I think, you know, we all know from being around Boach that he's not a guy who will make waves or, or demand that he has every single coach he wants on his staff. He's he's a guy who has uh, really sort of have a reputation for um, for finding common ground. And, uh, and I think that he will be able to do that. And even if this is last year under his contract, I think he's going to go into this uh, with a positive mindset and, uh, and just try to make the best of it. And like you said, my job is to make it work, whatever players I get. And, and, uh, and, and that's, I think, going to be the way he goes about things. But no question, I think, whether it happens you know, somewhere along the line this season or, or next off season, there's going to be a lot of changes in that front office. And as a result, I think there are a lot of people who are, frankly, a little bit worried about uh, you know, what their long-term job security might be. And, and that, that, that just comes with the territory when you make a change at the top. We're going to take a quick break to talk about our friends over at Hims. 66% of men lose their hair by age 35. Some of you Warriors fans probably have a joke about this regarding a certain Los Angeles Laker, but it's not funny when it happens to you. The thing is, when you start to notice hair loss, it's too late. And why do guys turn to weird solutions, or even worse, do nothing, when they can turn to medicine and science? 4 a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Thanks to science, baldness can be optional. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat hair loss. No waiting room, no awkward doctor visits, and save hours by going to 4 It's insanely easy. Answer a few quick questions, a doctor reviews them, and can prescribe you products which are shipped directly to your door. Order now, and TK's listeners get a trial month of Hims for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds of dollars if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. So, go to 4 slash TK. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash TK. 4 slash TK. We're going to take another quick break to talk about our friends over at Robinhood. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos all commission-free. They strive to make financial services work for everybody, not just the wealthy. The Robinhood app is insanely easy to use, which is fantastic for a novice like myself. Other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees. Trade stocks and keep all of your profits. There's easy to understand charts and market data. Place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. The Robinhood web platform also lets you view stock collections and analyst ratings of buy, hold, sell for every stock. Learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks and track favorite companies with personalized news feeds. Custom custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving our listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at tkshow.robinhood.com. 
That's tkshow.robinhood.com. And now, back to the TK Show. Well, one person at the very, very top uh, who doesn't have to worry about job security is Charles Johnson. And we got to talk about this a little bit. Uh, you've said some really smart things on Twitter about his donations. Uh, you know what, Bags? I'm going to ask I mean, you kind of hinted about this before all the stories broke. I th- did, haven't you? Kind of like. You know, if you check some of the donations from the top of the Giants, I haven't, didn't you mention something like that? Did you have an inkling some of this might be coming or that there would be an issue about some of these political donations with Charles Johnson? Well, what's changed isn't Charles Johnson's political donations. Uh, he's always been someone who has donated uh, to the campaigns up and down the Republican uh, um, uh, sort of hierarchy. I mean, he's, he's worth $5 billion dollars. He's, uh, I believe he's a Hoover fellow. Uh, he's somebody who is very much in line with the conservative machine in this country. So what's changed really isn't the fact that he works with lobbyists and that he donates, you know, to all different Republican persuasions. What's changed is the Republican persuasion. Yep. And the fact that that a lot of these candidates have become, you know, Trumpies, for lack of a better word, and have, uh, you know, become a little more too comfortable with things like white nationalism and things that we absolutely need to reject out of hand because we live in a civil society where, you know, you know, love is better than hate. I think we can all agree on that. So, um, you know, I I think this is probably, to be honest, going to be a good thing uh, in the long term because MLB came out today and they also had given some donations to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cindy Hyde and some of these other people and, and, and they asked for their donations back. And now they came out today and they said, you know what, we're going to suspend all political contributions until we can come up with a better process for vetting where this money is going, what the candidates are saying, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what? Good. And I hope that everybody who donates to Republican causes, and that goes for Democrats too, um, it has a better process. We're not just blindly hiring a lobbyist to scatter this money around on their behalf but to really be invested and find out what they're supporting, because in some cases you're supporting some pretty abhorrent stuff uh, and and some pretty abhorrent people that are putting out some really awful messages. So, you know, if if this just allows everyone to be a little less less laissez-faire about the whole thing and and, and pay more attention to it, uh, then I think that maybe our political process can get the tiniest bit better and more sane. So it may be a good thing. Go figure. I don't know if that's possible these days, but I would say the Charles Johnson thing's probably a little more deep. You know, I think he personally had some uh, more involvement in this, maybe than what he's saying he he has now. But I mean, these, some of these donations came after the controversy uh, about the candidate caught on tape talking about uh, you know in in purely racist terms. But I, and I but I agree with you that he's not anybody that this is not the franchise. This is the guy who probably has the most, or I guess we know has the most percentage ownership of the team, but it doesn't mean he's the team. Uh, the team is, right. it does, you know, actions its own. And we know how, you know, it does about inclusivity and about, you know, caring about those who are less fortunate. We know all that. This is not, this is not just PR for them. This is actually the things that the giants do believe in. Uh, do, do you think yeah. the, the news of this, Stun. I mean, just the outcry. I guess I would say. Maybe I don't think people in the organization are shocked that Charles Johnson is donating to, to staunch Republican candidates. But do you think just the outcry, the pu- public pu- public view of this, has shaken the franchise in any way? I mean, they shouldn't be surprised, just given what our political climate is, and given where we are in the Bay Area, especially. But uh, and you know, but uh, you know, I, I do know that uh, Larry Bear did organize for Charles Johnson to speak with. Uh, uh, the leader of the local chapter of the NAACP, who, who has rescinded um, his call for a boycott. And uh, and he's tried to um, mend some fences along those lines. And, and I think if you talk to people in the Giants organization, you know, and they obviously have to say this privately, but they're, they're deeply hurt by this because this is not what they stand for. You know, what they stand for is a lot of the stuff that the Giants Community Fund does. I mean, we're talking about 25,000 kids in, in 90 leagues that they help support to to play baseball. And beyond that, you've got anti-bullying campaigns and college scholarships, and and they have a grant program that they give money to, you know, HIV AIDS groups. And, and, you know, they did it until they're secure when there was still, you know, the the general climate in this country was one of homophobia and and that disease was, was, you know, looked on as, as something, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
different than it is today. So I, I think in a lot of ways, the Giants as an organization have been very courageous and, and very forward thinking, very progressive um, in, in being a, a, a part of the community and, and trying to help uh, in, in many different ways. And, and so, you know, the fact that a couple thousand dollar donations uh, from a more or less absentee owner would, would overshadow all that. Yeah. That's gotta be crushing for people who, who make this their livelihood and, and, and think every day about how they can make their communities better by what they do with the giants. So, um, you know, that's why the other day on Twitter, I shared a link to say, Hey, look, if, if you want to look at what they do, it's all right here. And you can even donate if it's something you want to support because that's, you know, you can't just judge them by one thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot going on in the organization, a lot of people doing good work, uh, um, that, you know, deserve to be, uh, celebrated for it. Who runs that good work? Was that, is that Larry Bear or is it come, does it, are there other owners who are more involved in the day to day who, who are, you know, have social causes? Uh, where does that come from? It's probably not coming from Charles Johnson. Well, no, it's, it's, it's a department within the front office, you know, community relations. We see them all the time. Um, you know, they're always in the clubhouse. Uh, Shana Daum is the executive vice president of that department. And she does a great job finding ways to get the, uh, the players uh, hooked up with different uh, charities and causes and that they believe in or that enmesh with their interests. And you know, getting them to, to go out to schools and, and give talks or host uh, groups at the ballpark, uh, even something as simple as who's going to catch the first pitch tonight, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, I think they're very involved on a day-to-day basis. But that's, that's, a, that's a core department in their front office, along with baseball operations, along with ticketing, along with advertising, along with, you know, uh, uh, client retention and, and, and all the other uh, uh, stuff that goes into a baseball front office. Yeah, I guess, I guess, anyways, is this coming from Larry Bear? I mean, it's under his direction that they have this sort of uh, feeling uh, for social causes. Yeah, I think so. I think it goes back, uh, you know, to the very beginning of the, the, the Peter McGowan group. You know, we saw Until There's a Cure, like I said, in, in the 1990s. So, um, you know, I, I think that's sort of been a core mission statement for as long as this ownership group has been in place. Yep. All right. As you get to the winter meetings, you you expect the Giants to, I mean, we know, we know Farhan has made a lot of moves in his time as, you know, as the assistant GM with A's, they certainly are a transactional team and the Dodgers, that's what they did. They just made a bunch of moves up and down that roster. Do you expect a ton of moves and are they set up for a ton of moves in the winter meetings this off season or might it kind of have to be over the long haul here? Well, I don't think they can do everything right away. Uh, the first action date where we're going to find out, you know, they're thinking on a few guys is this Friday, which is the tender deadline. Uh, and they've got a few players uh, um, that they have to make decisions over there. I would expect they're going to tender all of them. They've got, uh, you know, Gorky Hernandez, Joe Panic, obviously is coming off a really down year. Um, you've got uh, Will Smith, uh, Sam Dyson, Hunter Strickland, I believe, are their ARP guys. Um, I just don't think the Giants have enough talent to be non-tendering people. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they were, if they were the Tampa Bay Rays and they have to squeeze every nickel, you know, then, then maybe they non-tender a Joe panic, but I, I just don't think they can jettison any talent at this point. Uh, they have enough space on the 40 man roster. They didn't fill it all the way up with, uh, with guys to shield from the rule five draft. So they certainly have the roster flexibility to, to add guys, including some guys who may be non-tendered by other clubs yep. uh, and become free agents. And, and then, uh, you know, I, I do expect that we are going to see a much higher volume of transactions than we're used to, because if you can criticize the, the Sabian uh, sort of regime for, for one thing, it's being a little too insular and, and being maybe not, so, um, you know, cards on the table w- when they come to deal with other teams. And, and I think that uh, it, you're going to see a much more collaborative uh, front office with Farhan in charge. I think you're going to see, um, you know, maybe the possibility for three team trades, maybe <laughs> the possibility for, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a, a situation where, where I see um, maybe the Giants having a possibility to do something. You've got the Milwaukee Brewers, and we already know that they've been linked to Bumgarner in some trade talks. Maybe Bumgarner's part of this, and maybe he's not. But the Brewers went from like $65 million to $90 million, uh, in payroll last year. They've been uh, saying that they're not going to be able to go any higher, but they've got 12 arbitration guys they're going to have to give raises to. And they'll probably non-tender a few of them, but they're going to get up to about $110 million, and that's without doing a single thing. So, you know, you look at a, a trade that Farhan 
uh, and Andrew Friedman mean with the Dodgers, where they, they took on Matt Kemp and a lot of dead money and ended up getting a pretty decent player. Um, I think that you could see, what if you see Bumgarner go to the Brewers and have uh, the Giants take back Ryan Braun, and, and he's making, I think, $19 million next year and about maybe $17 million the year after that. Um, and then because you take Braun and his salary, uh, you were able to get all of a sudden two or three really, really good prospects, like a Preston Hero or some of these guys in the Brewers system. You know, anything that can sort of accelerate the, the talent infusion, uh, especially in numbers, in quantity, I, I think that they're going to have to, they're going to be all in on and, and might be a deal with a structure like that, uh, that allows them to do that because the giants do have money that they can spend. Uh, they, they, they're not going to go over the, uh, the CBT, but, uh, that goes up to about 206 million next year. And we know there's some money that dropped off their payroll from Hunter Pence and others. So I think that you will see them use that to their advantage. If it means that they can get some other talented players in, uh, maybe attached to a contract that someone needs to jettison. So, um, you know, that could just be kind of an example of sketching out a move that might make sense. And there's going to be a lot of moves like that. I think that'll be out there. And, and I expect the, the, the level of discussions are going to be, the volume of discussions is going to be higher than what we're used to. Interesting that you, you mentioned the Brewers because what was the trade that he brought up after he'd left the A's? So when Billy Bean and Dave Forrest picked up Chris Davis while they were supposedly rebuilding. Uh, because yep. Chris Davis was coming up on a, a money number that that the Brewers didn't, you know, they had a, obviously had a ton of talent, and they, and they moved him. You wouldn't have thought he'd be moved to the A's, but that was just a, a surprising move that, that Farhan mentioned as an example. That's why we, the, the Brewers always seem to have those guys that he, other teams kind of want to go get. Go get. They do have a lot of talent. I'm sure he, Farhan would like to be a team that gets a lot of talent and then can trade some of sure. it for other things. Would you, and I don't mean to minimize that, that the Giants front office under you know Brian Bobby Evans yeah. hasn't done some of those creative things. I think that's actually been one area that they've pretty consistently looked to mine, uh, you know, who are some arbitration guys that are getting a little too expensive for their teams? Yep. And is there an opportunity there? And, and, you know, I look at the off season where they got Melky Cabrera and Angel Pagan. Uh, they got two of those guys and they ended up being, you know, the, the engine drivers for, you know, the, the top of their lineup uh, in 2012 until Melky got suspended, which is probably the best offense that they've had under yep. Bruce Bochy. Yep. So, um, you know, it's, it's not to say that the Giants haven't been creative like that in the past, but, uh, you know, I think you're going to see e even more uh, uh, exploration of, of what are some out-of-the-box ideas. All right, Bags, had you have you on for Plinka? Keep talking, but let's uh, let's wrap this up with a question that you, in particular, I'm going to ask with much interest. I've asked you before, but I'm sure you've got some more restaurants on your mind. Andrew Baggerly, what's your favorite restaurant? Okay, so I think when you asked me this before, I said Pock Pock in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. which which I definitely hit up when I went to. Oregon uh, for the Joey Bart story <laughs> that we did last year. Love I, mean, I, I think that was my first stop after landing at PDX. Um, so I won't give you that one again. I will tell you that since I am going back to Chicago this uh, weekend and driving down to Indy for the Big Ten Championship. Yeah, I believe game, there's a school that's uh, playing in that that we are very familiar with, but go ahead. And it's not the Buckeyes. <laughs> not the Buckeyes. Not the Buckeyes. Uh, so I'll give you a Chicago tip, and this one will not break your bank. You can probably get out of there for less than 10 bucks, and it's uh, the best Italian beef sandwich in all of Chicagoland. Make sure you get the sweet peppers and the hot peppers. Herm's Palace on uh, on Dempster in Skokie, Illinois, right wow. on the Skokie Evanston border. And uh, yeah, that's the Chicago dog. They do a great Chicago dog too. But you got to get the Italian beef, and uh, and you'll thank me later. I love it. Uh, we got a shot. You think in Saturday against those evil? I don't know. I think there's a I, shot. I, I think there's a. I mean, again. Don't Northwestern does not tend to match up well with those top top teams, but I didn't think they were going to match up with a lot of these teams, and they won a lot at the end. So I think they, I, I think Ohio State might have shot his wad a little bit in the last week. You know, I mean that that's just about as good as they're ever going to play. We'll see, and, and it'll probably end up seventy to ten on, on the wrong side. But I think there's a shot at this. Well, the the Cats didn't play almost anybody in the second half of that game against Illinois, even when yep. Illinois had a yep. chance pulled to tie the, it up. Pulled and... the quarterback. Yep, yep, pulled everybody yep. And, and all the defensive players. I think they're going to be probably the healthiest they've been all season. And they're going to have to play a perfect game, and they're going to have to keep the Ohio State receivers in front of them. Um, and, and obviously Clayton Thorson is going to have to have the game of his life. But um, you know what? We at Northwestern do um, 
irrational optimism about as well as anybody. And, and, and every once in a while it's rewarded. So I'm just going there to have a lot, a lot of fun with a bunch of my friends that I know from school. We're going to make the drive to Indy and, and, uh, and it's indoors. We're not going to be shivering in 15 degree weather. So that's nice. And, uh, and we'll just hope for, for a good outcome, and, and who knows, maybe there'll be a Rose Bowl at the end. And screw all up that the playoff scenarios. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. <laughs> all right, Bags, great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. Okay, thanks, Tim. Everybody, that's the TK Show for today. Thanks.